Um, I'm known for my impatience, and uh, that's all I'll say about this one before I read it. <laughs> Returning Madame Bovary. At the bookstore counter, I am waiting on a cashier who won't take my return without managerial approval to be granted by Bill, who is on managerial break. And I wonder that what if, what if I lean across this counter, scattering the blue and black ink pens, the red foiled chocolates, and grab his narrow necktie, choke him slightly, pull his pocked face to mine, and kiss him, pushing my tongue into his mouth while sliding my hand down the front of his flat front khakis to his crotch. Then would I get what I want. <laughs> After all, isn't that what we all want? To be pursued with single-minded urgency, to have customers, lovers, readers, who are like the man who's been sitting in prison for ten years with only his mother and blonde cousin for visitors. To have him reach through the bars to what's past them, to the female prison guard who lingers, studies her nails, counts floor tiles, like she's waiting for something more than the end of the shift. My lover teaches me seven card stud deuces wild. I should have been a man with a paunch and receding hairline with a gold nugget pinky ring. A man who can read signs like a lover. A lover who knows what she means when his woman, without thinking, brushes her fingertips across her clavicle. What would it be like to have a name like the kamikaze kid, devilfish, or Diamond Jack, a name like the edge of a knife. Think, to play against the probabilities, to live by the slick slip of cards. I could tell the bluffs and hide my own, see clearly what I couldn't know for sure, mask my beating insides behind a cigar, a slug of whiskey. Sitting here across from you, I don't need your hand pushing my cards toward my chest. I need the breath, the kiss of a lady against the back of my neck. Um, this next one needs a little introduction. Um, this one is about uh, Petrarch, and uh, who is a poet crediting with perfecting the form of the Italian sonnet. Um, and he wrote multiple love sonnets um, to uh, Laura. Um, a married woman and his love went unrequited and, and Laura died. So, okay. <laughs> so, anyway. The, eh, happy ending. All right. So, um, anyway, they, they decided on uh, the anniversary of, you know, Petrarch's birth or some such thing, that they were going to have a bust made of Petrarch's face. So they exhume um, his body and are going to use his skull to you know, to form the reconstruction. Um, and then they realized that uh, it wasn't Petrarch's skull. So, okay. <laughs> this is called Pretty Little Rooms, and there's an epigraph. Um, the remains of who was thought to be the Renaissance poet, Francesco Petrarch, are instead those of two different people. DNA tests have confirmed. The skull was unexpected. A surprise in the pink marble tomb in 1873, the old doctor of Padua claimed it had crumbled, as though too injured to live outside that stone room. Did he keep it on his desk, on his shelf as a specimen, an exemplar of perfection, the knitted plates a symbol of all that we cannot know of love? The doctor was not the only man who needed. A friar fled his flagged cell, hacked off the poet's arm, spirited it back, a drunk friar, in such grief for the world, so moved as to steal the physical. And where and how to keep it, this limb that had once moved to love's measure. And now, these scientists with their test tubes, their milliliters and tweezers are used to wounds and hairs, blood and shatter. 
in their white coats and lives. They don't ask questions they don't know the answers to. They brush away quarry dust, measure the circumference, count the alleles, and approximate the years, all equating female. Nobody asks whose body was not loved enough that her skull could travel like a pebble, could be used to punctuate the line of a man's body. Um, Crater Lake uh, is the deepest lake um, in the U.S. and um, it's out in Oregon um, and it snows there from October to June, something like this. Um, and they average something like 533 inches of snow per year. So you, you get the idea. Um, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful um, place uh, and that's the, the setting um, of this particular piece. After snowfall at Crater Lake, Pausing in this blank, even the snowplow with its scrubbing engine is quiet. Parting the snow, packing new on old to stop the cold so it can all refreeze during the night like memory. The road is being cleared for tomorrow. The lake, the dormant volcano crater, is clear. And I imagine I can see all the way to the lake bed. On the surface, the ripples rock back and forth like pendulums, counting. Caught in that rhythm, that scrub of cleansing, I think for a moment that all the tourists, all the lovers who have ticked through here, pile up, word on word, shutter click on top of shutter click, held kiss on kiss, word on stopped word. Lake water gentles in a once fiery volcano. The snow hides and holds the shape of the landscape. In an upper window of the closed inn being remodeled, a light flicks on. Its gold burns through the white and a figure holds, spreads arms up and out, encompassing the scenery, me, everything. The arms lifted and measured. Um, this next poem um, involves Houdini, and this is sort of another kind of stolen thing. Um, I was sitting around and watching a, a you know, biography on TV about Houdini, um, and uh, wanted to figure out how to use it, so this is, this is how I ended up doing it. Um, it's called A Drowning. We sit in the club with gin, candlelight, and a magician performing small acts from table to table. You run fingers over my wrist as though practicing some sleight of hand, but you're wondering when we'll fall apart. Drunk and trying to dispel the moment, I hold the candle at an angle so the flame licks glass. The heat builds, burns my fingers, but I hold it until the glass pops, cracks, then I laugh, my trick done. You tell me about Houdini as a child, almost drowning in a small lake, but spending his life in immersion, time and again, chained, bound, boxed, lowered into icy water. I am impressed when you explain the years spent building a threshold for pain, until he could endure the Chinese water torture. Until he could endure the Chinese water torture with a broken ankle, which stung more than the stomach ache he'd noticed before the sucker punch from the college boxer. He might have felt a chill resting between acts backstage, but would have chalked it up to water until Detroit, where he had to admit he hurt. Fever over 105. The doctors convinced him to let them operate. They opened the man who defeated death, revealed insides already corroding, already flooded. 